And, and I know, you know, we, we see this, this kind of re- reoccurring theme, the sovereignty of the Lord. We see God's social justice. And we see just an epic story of redemption for not just, you know, like not just for a king or not just for like an area, but we see this for an entire nation. And we look at that and we go, well, you know, we look at the nation of Israel, right? The whole congregation, both both Judah and Israel and the entire congregation, everybody that is Israel. And then even as part of our name and part of our logo being grafted church, right, is that we have become the Israel, right? We, so we see this, this redemption like it just continues to roll and roll and roll and roll. Um, let's go to, to Amos. We're going to go to chapter 5 real quick because Mustache Mike had posted something. I don't know if he posted it on the, uh, on the church page or if it was on his personal page. And uh, Man, it was really cool because uh, chapter 5 is verse 24. It just says, but let justice roll down like waters. And righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Like, man, if we had to just sum this whole thing up, we would see, let the Lord's sovereignty roll down like waters. <laughs> like an ever-flowing stream. Let the Lord's love roll down like waters. Let the Lord, you know, let the Lord's redemption roll down like waters. It's good stuff. But I, I love that because it just kind of sums it up. Um, and I know we have... We have st- kind of skipped over a lot of stuff in, in each of these chapters, but, uh, but we're kind of getting, you know, getting to the meat of it, getting to the core of it. Now, chapters 7, 8, and 9, these last three, I could, I could probably preach for a month on each one of these. And I probably would not be popular after that. But, so we're going to break this down. Hopefully you guys have read this. If you haven't, well, yeah, shame on you. If you haven't, uh, yeah, get to cracking right now. <laughs> so uh, here's the other thing. This morning, I did not bring my little outline notes, so I got to do the same and turn up here and, and look and see what, what we're talking about. So we're starting in, in chapter 7, or continuing in chapter 7 here, and we're going to start in verse 7. Now, let's talk a little bit, just a little bit of an overview on chapter 7 is, is God, okay, God is showing Amos visions. He is showing this dude stuff. And he's seeing a lot of stuff that's maybe not so good, a lot of stuff that is good, but he's showing him some some visions. And it's so cool that, you know, God is not, uh, you know, I say it a lot. He's not this lofty thing, this lofty idea. God is a very personal and personable God. And often he calls us and he calls us by name. And he calls Amos, he says, Amos, paraphrasing, dude, check this out. (laughs) Amos, check it out, man. Look at this. And so he shows him all this stuff. Now we know, we know that there is this kind of impending doom coming, right? I mean, if you haven't learned anything about the Minor Prophets yet, you you should know. You should learn this. I've given you several spoiler alerts that in the end here, well, not really in the end, in the end, but along the story, The kingdoms get besieged. They get burned. The walls get breached. People die. There is mayhem and pandemonium. It's right. It's nuts. So there's not a lot of good stuff as far as what's what's coming happening. However, this message is always coupled with something good. So God is showing Amos all the doom, but He's also showing him the redemption piece. So He sees this, and and um, in chapter seven we see that He shows him the the locusts. And then he says, Amos, I'm also uh, showing you, what is it? Oh, uh, judgment by fire. So he shows him all this stuff. But, what, but we're going to get down to the meat of this chapter, to the point of this. I've got three points today, one in each chapter that we're going to get to. And we're not going to neglect the rest because hopefully there will be other stuff that you guys read in the rest and be able to come to me and go, man, you skipped over this and this is epic. Yes, okay. Verse 7. This is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. 
And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? Calling him by name, Amos. And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel, and I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid to waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. So we also know that, uh, that in chapter 7, it goes on, and we, and we have a little bit more background on Amos, the actual prophet, right, where, we, where you know, he goes and he's prophesying to the north kingdom's kind of pseudo, you know, fake priest, and he's prophesying against you know, them and the, and the king, and that's where they have the whole debate. And he says, look, man, I'm just a regular dude, right? Fig farmer, sheep herder, I'm a herdsman. Okay, I'm nobody special, but the Lord has got a word for you. So, so we see this all also played out in chapter 7. However, this is what I really want to focus on is that plumb line. Does anybody know what a plumb line is? We use it to align something. We use it to align something. Okay? So if you notice, if you were to look down at your feet and see this very busy carpet tiles, right? This is not one rolled carpet. These are tiles that are laid. Now you notice, for the most part, they're pretty much straight, right? It's in line with everything else in the building. Okay? Is that just because there's a guy who came in who was really good and said, that looks pretty straight? No. All right? So what he had to do is he had to lay down a plumb line. Now, before the great flood of 2014, back in the nursery, a monumental event happened. Teddy and Tammy went back there, and they had laid carpet tiles. And it was so, it was so cool because they used a ruler and yardsticks, and they used measuring tapes, and then, then, eventually, and then eventually, you know what they got? They were women empowered. They were empowered with a chalk line. So they were in there snapping chalk lines left and right. And they laid down a plumb line, of which they laid the first row of tiles straight. Then all the others were built on that. So this is, this is, okay, this is epic, believe it or not. This is epic. Because God, so he shows Amos that the Lord is standing next to a wall with a plumb line. Now, you go, well, what's so important about that? Let's talk about a word real quick. I've got a definition up here. Ortho. The word ortho means rule. Straight, upright, vertical, perpendicular, or correct. Ortho. Which we derive other words from like orthodox or orthodoxy. Customary or conventional, right? Or rule or straight or upright or perpendicular or correct. As means or method established. So it's what we believe to be straight, to be in line, to be correct. Then we get the word orthoprox or orthopraxy, which is the practice of the orthodox, which is based off what you believe as being the ortho, right? Straight. Orthopedics means to straighten you out, right? Yeah, orthodontics, straighten your grill. Correctness of orthodoxy, of action or practice. All right, I need a volunteer, which usually means that you're going to get voluntold. Here, Danny, come here, man. Have you ever seen one of these before? Do you know what it is? No? We call it a square. It's a carpenter square. All right, now we could go back and we could look at the manufacturer of this square, which I did, and I Googled how they made these and it's like laser etched and all this stuff, right? A whole bunch of engineering terms. But what we have to do is we have to believe that this thing is perfectly square, right? All right? What kind of angle is that? 90 degrees. Okay. So let's call this our orthodox. Let's call it, right, do you believe it to be straight and true? Yeah, me too. All right. So this is what I want you to do, man. I want you to take this thing, and I want you to find a right angle in this building. That corner back there, it looks pretty 90 degrees, right? I just want you to take that and go and just put it on that corner and tell me if it is. Mm -hmm. It's actually 90 degrees. Because that is a right angle, and we know that thing to be true, and we know it to be straight. 
<clears throat> yeah, just put it on there. Yeah, yeah. What do you got, man? Almost 90? Is it perfect, though? Do you have a gap? A little? Is it more than 90 or less than 90? A little less than 90 degrees. All right, now this, this is your real mission. I want you to stand there and I want you to make that thing straight. You think you can make that happen? The, yeah, right? Yeah, the angle's made of aluminum. Can you make that wall straight? No. All right. All right, good job, man. Good job. Yay. I got another thing set up here that you might see or may not be able to see. That is a laser level. Yep, this is a laser level. So what we're looking at here is we got this thing sitting here, and um, we want to look at the actual, how level, let's say, these shelves are. So I'll measure it, and I'll see that on this side, you know, it's an inch and a half. On this side, oh, looks like an inch and nine sixteenths. Is that straight or is that level? No. But we know that this is. The shells are not even, right? Okay. But do you think the guys who built these shells and put this up when our building was under reconstruction, that they said, all right, let's go ahead and make this like, let's go ahead and make this like, you know, 16 degrees. Yeah. Let's drop a 16th down on this side and maybe a, you know, a 28, 30 seconds on that side? No. What do they try to do? Trying to make it straight. Those corners back there, what did they try to do? Can we make it straight? I asked Danny too. He can't. We can't. We could, yeah, we could look at this all, you know, all kinds of engineering feats. However, we'd have to tear it apart, and then we'd have to build it again, but really again, would it be straight? Not necessarily, all right? Now, I have built some pretty tremendous things out of wood. And that wood was a little bit wet still. And when it dried, guess what it did? It warped. The point is, is we cannot make anything straight. We can't make anything perfect. We cannot do that. However, what we can do is we can rely on the rule or the orthodox things in our lives to believe that those are straight. That's a laser. That is a coherent beam is what that is. A series of photons all moving at the same wavelength in the same direction remaining close to each other. According to all the rules and laws of physics, the beam is perfect. It's straight. Now, are there anything that you can think of, let's say, does anybody here have something in your life that maybe is not quite straight? Right. So it's a tough thing for me to stand up here and tell you I'm right when I'm no different than that shell for this one or that corner. It's, it's really hard for me to say, oh man, Diana is correct. Or the Janet is right on. Because we can't be. Sin makes us... Uh, Makes us anything but level. Makes us anything but perpendicular. Makes us anything but upright. So what we have to do is we have to lean on and rely on the things in our lives that we know are straight, without the shadow of a doubt. We have to believe that the, that the, the carpenter square was manufactured 
perfectly perpendicular, and that a laser actually is a perfect beam, and that the little bubble level on my laser level over there is actually showing the level of the earth, right? The horizon of, of the earth. Now, what we look at here and we see is that when things in our lives are messed up, what does God do? In verse 7, the Lord stands beside the wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Behold, I am setting the plumb line in the midst of my people. Now, what do you think that that plumb line may be? I'll, I'll give you a guess. It's a dude who is the Lord, and his name starts with J. <laughs> it is Jesus. See, at this point, the Israelites had already received the law. So this is a twofold thing, right? We got the Lord going, making a promise, yeah, reinstilling my word, the law back into you, and know that the day is coming where I will set a plumb line amongst my people in Israel. It shows him the good with the bad. God has a plan for our lives, and that plan is to be redeemed and to be reconciled with him. But here's the thing, is we have to believe that the plumb line is true. You have to believe that it is. If you don't, well, I don't, I don't know. What are you building your wall on? See, and you have to understand, too, that our efforts, you know, when this building was built, that corner back there was built with the intention of being exactly 90 degrees. And we could tear it down and rebuild it and tear it down and rebuild it and tear it down and rebuild it. And eventually, when you do things like lay carpet tiles that are laser etched and lay hardwood floors that are laser etched and use things like you know, measuring tapes to try and put furniture down. The thing is, is that the imperfections begin to stand out. I didn't know that that corner was messed up until this morning. I walked up to it just like Danny did and went clack, 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 clack. Yep, that's messed up. It may appear to be okay on the outside. However, we know that that is not just a sheetrock issue. We know that that's a frame issue, and we know that there's nails in there that are tweaked, and we know that there's measurements that are not quite right. We know that there is other stuff going on behind the surface that makes that, in, that, makes that thing imperfect. However, the thing is, is the hope is that we have is that we keep our plumb line close to the things that are imperfect. And we were, were reminded of what's true and what's good and what's honest and what's fair and what's straight. And we know that we can cling to that because that is our goal, that straight laser level line named Jesus. So God makes a promise here and says, look, I'm not going to leave you guys flailing where you're at because, man, when... We become parts of societies like what, what we've read about here, false religions set up, right? Compromising morals, people treating other people, nations treating other nations different ways, propaganda, speeches. We stand, it, man, it becomes difficult in a world that's so full of evil to go, well, what's right and what's wrong? And who's right in this situation? And where is this nation standing? And who, what is that president saying? And what is it? We keep Jesus in front of us. We keep the plumb line amongst us. We remain true. We always have that thing to go back to. Because I can tell you this. Let's say that corner back there that we know is a little less than 90 degrees, right? You saw what you said? A little less than 90 degrees. Let's say we had laid all of our carpet tiles according to that corner. <laughs> 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 
right? Yeah, you got, half you guys be sitting here like this going, if I look down, it's just nauseating. I can't, this is, not, it's not right. So he's going to set a plumb line amongst Israel. Keeping in mind these words, when we see this, and we, especially in the New Testament, when we go in and we start looking at ortho, orthodox, orthoprox, orthoproxy, orthodoxy, to understand what is straight and what is true. This is a promise made here in chapter 7. This is really, really, really good news. Really good news. Moving forward into chapter 8. Now, we could, like I say, we could go on and on and on, but I, I don't want to beat this up. I just want you guys to see God's promise to us in this. Woo. Chapter 8. Man, there's like so much good stuff I want to cover, but I'm refraining, okay? Self-control level expert right now. <clears throat> Chapter 8, verse 11. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. And, and you, you know, you kind of think about that and you go, well, well what's, what's the big deal? You know, there's... There's whole countries, there's whole nations that don't have the word of the Lord. But which, what we don't stop to realize or don't stop to fully understand is the impact and how deeply God's word impacts us and how much that guides us. I know there's probably some of you going, oh my gosh, I couldn't imagine living a day without the word of the Lord. Now, there are 15, 20, 40, 50, 12 examples that I could look at in a time of times where the people were lacking the word of the Lord. And this, like, after the besiegement, and then that whole 400 years before another prophet spoke, yeah, that's kind of a demoralizing time to go, well, how long do we have to wait? You know, do we got to wait like two years? You know, sometimes like we have debt and we go, ah, I'll have that paid off in three years. Could you imagine getting a statement that says, okay, yep, nothing good coming in 400 years? It'd be like, ooh, All right? So it's 400 years. However, we're going to go to a part of Scripture that is very near and dear to my heart, All right, one of my favorite men in the Bible. We're going to go to the book of Nehemiah. So I'm going to give you time to turn to Nehemiah, and we will be in chapter 8 in Nehemiah. Now, let's, let's backtrack, or not backtrack, but it's a kind of sidetrack, right? Going back to the timeline I showed in the very beginning of all the way from the split of the kingdom to where Jesus is epic. And we know that we have all the minor prophets in that. They are all speaking of and leading up to this besiegement. Assyria besieging the north, Babylon besieging the south. Now, here's the cool thing, right? Is the Lord promised redemption. We see it, obviously, in the prophets that we're talking about, major prophets, right? We see it all over the, the whole scripture. So moral of that story is, particularly the south kingdom, we see that, there's a, that that captivity exists for about 70 years. 70. You know, in this day and age, sometimes it seems like you can get home loans for 70 years. All right? We can have trusts that last 70 years. There's things that can, that can happen for 70 years. So they're in captivity for 70 years, and all these, all these other things happen, right? These, like, really epic things of the Lord happen, like the whole book of Esther. Like, all that stuff happens in that 70 years. But at the end, they come back. God says, come back, and he's going to start the restoration process. Now, when you want to really look at the impact of, of what it means to have a famine for the word of the Lord, we can look at that now. I just watched a video that I didn't bring and should be showing right now, but I didn't have it together here, to show of 
you know, in communist China of a group of Chinese people getting Bibles for the first time and their excitement in that because they've been without it. So, but we can see this illustrated here. So we have my man Nehemiah, and he's the governor now of Jerusalem. He is back there, and he, is re, he has rebuilt the wall, and he's partnered up with his boy Ezra, the priest. And Ezra, so Nehemiah says, all right, this is what we're going to do, man. We're going to get this thing back together, get the wall back up, and all this stuff. And Ezra, here's one of your main jobs, is you are going to instill the Word of God back into the people, because they have not heard it for 70 years. An entire generation has passed. They, don't have, they have not had it in their hands. They haven't been in nations that were really like conducive to them worshiping God. So, we start in verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And Ezra... And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, and that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard, on the first day of the seventh month. And they read from it, facing the square before the water gate, and from early morning until midday, in the presence of men and women and those who could understand. And all the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on the wooden uh, platform that they had made for this purpose. And beside him stood all these other dudes. And they are the elders. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting their hands. And they bowed their heads and they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And Yeshua and all these other dudes. Yeah, Sam, yeah. They helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. So the elders went out into the crowd and said, you guys have questions. Do you, are you understanding what Ezra's telling you, what he's reading right now? And, and he helped every, they, they helped everybody understand, right? That's part of the job of the elders in the church is to make sure you understand the word of the Lord. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood it reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said, Go your way. Eat the fat and drink the sweet wine and send the portions to anyone who has nothing. Who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved for the Joy of the Lord is our strength. And they went on and they celebrated the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, this may sound, as we read it, kind of anticlimactic, but, but listen, in 1997, I was stationed in Okinawa, Japan, and I went down to Australia, and I was on an island off the coast of Australia that was a big impact area. So big naval ships were, were shooting, and they were bombing the island, and... and um, and F-111s were coming by, and they were bombing the island, and there was infantry coming and doing operations on the island, and I was up, I was part of the communications crew. So I got to watch this whole thing from this mountain up on this island, as we basically just decimated this island. Now, being part of communications, right, even though I was a technician, so I kind of sat around and waited for stuff to break, we got to listen to all the communications. We got to listen to all the, all the bombing runs happen, all the missions being played out, all the artillery calling in their fire missions. And then there was a distress call from an F-111 that was having issues. And we could hear the traffic on the radio, but we couldn't see it. But you had all these different parts of the island, all these Marines, all these Australian sailors, it was all these folks in different places on the island, but we're up on the mountain up on the end. And then we saw it. 
And we saw that F-111 coming from over the ocean, crossing the island, trying to get back to the mainland part of Australia where he could land. And he started having issues, and he was having all these issues, and a bunch of pilot talk I, I didn't understand, I didn't really care about. But what I knew was this thing was getting ready to go down. And so he's coming, and, his, and he's coming, F-111s don't fly slow, okay? Just so you know, they're fighter jets, they don't fly slow. And he's fully loaded with munitions. So he's got bombs on board, and he is losing altitude very, very quickly. And as he's coming by, okay, it was so loud him coming over the top of the mountain where we were. It felt like we could reach up and touch him, but we couldn't. Obviously, he was several hundred feet above us, but this thing was dropping fast, and it was another little hump on that mountain about another 2,000 yards away, and he's coming down, and it looks like he is going to make impact with this thing. Now, when all the people stood up and shouted and raised their hands... What I want you to understand is as this distress call is coming, there's now Marines and sailors coming out of the bush, coming up onto this mountain, out to where we could see where this F-111 looked like he was going down. And as he peeked that other little hump on the mountain, everybody stood up and they raised their hands and they screamed because they thought he was going to crash. And then somehow or another, he turned on an afterburner or something. It got really loud, and it got really hot really fast. And then he took off somewhere, something to go and made his way. But there was such an adrenaline rush because we thought we were going to have a fighter jet crash on our hands. But understand that that adrenaline rush made us stand up and raise our hands and yell out. Seventy years They've not heard or seen or touched the Word of God. When Ezra opened the book, the people stood up and they raised their hands and they yelled out. Seventy years. In Amos, he says that there will be a famine and it won't be for food and it won't be for water, but it'll be for hearing of the Word of the Lord. And the thing is, is that we all experience those little famines along the way in life. It's hard for us in our own society, in our own culture, to see it, the moral decay and how, how many like Christian and biblical values that our, that our country has had and been for so long and to kind of watch that all fall down. However, the thing is, is that when you get pulled away from that, you begin to realize, man, how much of God's presence that there is in our lives. How much of His Word is standing and existing. And to not have that, those are dark days. Those are dark days. So, so understand that when we see a prophecy like this, man, those droughts, those low spots, Israel was going to experience this, and they did experience this, and they experienced this several times, and several times over to not have the word of the Lord. So we see the plumb line set. As we're moving forward here, we now see a famine that's coming. Now we're going to get here to chapter 9. Next theme, next point, next objective. So we go one through four. And I saw the Lord standing beside the altar. Okay, so the altar, this is, this is his house. Okay, like you got to understand, like when the Lord's standing beside a wall or standing beside a river, kind of that's one thing. But when he stands beside the altar... This is a little bit different because we look at an altar as this, as a stage with carpet, these cool little music stands and nice little chairs. But in this context, what happens at the altar? Yeah, I like Kevin. He's like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Sacrifice happens at the altar. The altar of the Lord. Right, Because who else's altar would the Lord be standing at? 
but his own. And this is the altar of which he sacrificed. So the Lord is standing beside the altar and he says, Strike the capitals until the thresholds shake and shatter them on the heads of all the people. And those who are left of them I will kill with the sword. Not one of them shall flee away. Not one of them shall escape. If they dig into Shoal, from there shall my hand take from there shall my hand take them. If they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. If they dig into Shoal, what does Shoal mean? Hmm? It's the grave. It's the grave. It's hell. Like, <laughs> almost like purgatory, right? That's the, the because what? It's not a good place because God's presence isn't there. It's a Jewish tradition of it being like purgatory. It's not a right. So Shoal, we see, is referred to as the grave or as the hell. And the, word for he- the Hebrew word for heaven, or right when we translate that Hebrew word, what, is it, what does it literally translate to? Sky. Sky. Okay? That's, that's what it is. All right? And that's all a cool lesson and everything, but what I, need, what I need, really need you guys to understand here is to go, listen, listen. If the people dig themselves all the way to hell, God will reach down and take them. If they climb all the way up to heaven, and we know right all of the connotation and negative connotation that came with the Tower of Babel because the people were trying to raise themselves up to where? To heaven, to the sky, to make a great name for themselves in opposition to the Lord. So it's like, man, Mike said this in the book of Joel. When he talked about it in Joel, he's like, what can you do? The locusts are coming. What, what are you going to do, man? You're going to, dude, I'll dig myself all the way to hell itself. And there will be the hand of the Lord to yank you out because you're going to face what's coming to you. Oh, no, it's cool, man. I'll, I'll climb a tower. I'll build a, man, I will build the Tower of Babel. And I'll climb up there. And at the very, very least, I know Frank won't come up there because he's terrified of heights. No, Lord will find you up there too. This is, listen, this is not a good, this is not, this is not good. (laughs) Okay, this is not good. This is saying, this is coming, you cannot, there is nowhere you can run. Nowhere you can climb to, nowhere you can dig to. This is going to happen. This is tough. And he goes on and he talks about being at the top of, of Carmel or going down to the bottom of the sea. And that's cool because God will send a critter to get you down there. That's not terrifying or anything. Yep, three-headed dog stuff, whatever. Understand that there is no escape from this judgment that's coming. All of this stuff we talked about, chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3, everybody's got what's coming to them in in this context. Now, here we go. Here we go, the story of redemption. This is what I love right here. We're going to start in chapter 11, or chapter 11. Chapter 9, verse 11. And even in my Bible right here, the little title says the restoration of Israel. In that day I will rise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches. The house of David, the booth, the tabernacle, the dwelling place, right? The family or the bloodline of David. And raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. And they may possess the remnant of Edom. And all the nations who are called by my name, all nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of the grapes, him who sows the seed. 
and on and on and on. Right? And he goes on, he says in 14, I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel. That's good news. That's really good news. No. Let's jump forward to the book of Acts. We're going to shift gears. Go to Acts chapter 15. God is promising restoration. Now, we're going to look at this because I even said last week how the minor prophets shape the doctrine of the church today. Or they should anyway, right? Because even the early church looked at this big time, okay? So I'm going to set this scene for you. Here, here's the deal. We're going, to sh- we're going to shift gears, right? So we know what's happening. We know what's happening to Israel. We, we know what Amos is writing about. We know what Amos is all about. Now, let's, let's move forward. We're going to move forward about 780 years, something like that, okay? And here we are in the book of Acts, and we've got, uh, we've got, the, we've got this, this awesome cast. We've got this crew on the scene right here. We've got Paul. We've got Barnabas. We got Peter, and uh, and who else we got, man? Maybe James, and we got uh, Silas. Okay, so we got all these kind of righteous dudes here. Now, here's the deal. Here's here. Let me set, let me set the scene. Okay, um, they've just kind of they've just been at Lystria, and Paul got stoned so badly for preaching the gospel that they thought he died. But his buddies dragged him out and <laughs> said, "Hey, look, he's still alive." Okay, let's, and, what, and what do they do? Let's go preach more of the gospel. Amen, brother. Okay, so Paul's just been stoned, so he's looking, he's looking jacked up, okay? He is not pretty right now. Okay, so Paul and Barnabas, where they do, where they do is they go back to the city of Antioch. Now, how many Antiochs are there mentioned? Like 11 Antiochs, okay? There's all these different cities of Antioch. So, it describes that they're in Antioch in Syria. How many Antiochs are there in Syria? Okay, about 11 of those 11 Antiochs are in Syria. So exactly which Antioch he's in is kind of irrelevant. But here's the deal. So, so, so Paul is looking, looking beat up, right? He obviously lost that fight. Um, but he lived, so I guess he won. Uh, <laughs> He's in, he's, in, uh, he's in Antioch with his boys, and we're starting in uh, 15, verse 1. It says, But some men came down from Judea, and were teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, were you commonly refer to guys at this time, preaching this, right? Now, this is some years after Jesus. So Jesus has been here. He's come. He's gone. And he's left his Holy Spirit. Okay? So these guys are rock and roll, and they're establishing the church. Now, you, you have this kind of old school group, and what we call them is we call them the Judaizers. And these guys are saying, okay, hey, all is good. This is cool. Jesus came. He died. He preached the gospel. You know, he went. He rose again. He, de- he defeated the shoal. He ascended, he sent the Holy Spirit, this place is on fire, but none of it means anything unless you've been circumcised and you follow the law of Moses. Okay? So you got this whole sect of these dudes coming down and saying this. They've been teaching, they've been teaching this. This is so, unless this stuff happens, unless you've been circumcised according to the law of Moses, because in order to keep the law of Moses, you have to be circumcised. So unless you do all that, you cannot be saved. Straight up, they said it right here you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them. Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So this dissension rises up in the church because you got these factions. Because you got, now now we're we're starting the blending. So we got Gentiles and we got Jews and we got Jews who believe and we got Gentiles who believe, and we have these two factions. So there's one group standing up saying, yeah, no. 
and another group going, you got to be circumcised. you got to follow the law of Moses. can't be saved. So this thing busts out in the church so badly that they finally say, okay, well, we can't settle this. So we're going to elect a group of guys, and you guys need to go to Jerusalem. You need to talk to some of the other apostles, and they're going to reach out to, again, the church elders and say, let's, let's settle this. So, they, so Paul's still kind of jacked up. He's, he goes. Uh, this is verse 3. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversation of the Gentiles. And they brought great joy to all the brothers. And when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done, had, had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to be circumcised uh, or it's necessary to circumcise them in order that they keep the law of Moses. Now, here's the thing. Here's what is like kind of, this is what's shady about this, right? Is that these guys are not wrong. They're not wrong. If you are going to keep the law of Moses, you must be circumcised. You must be. So, so it gets confusing, right? Because they're going, well, wait a second. So you got these guys saying, well, in order to keep the law of Moses, we have to be circumcised. Yeah, true story. That checks out. But then we got this other group going, but you have to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. Well, that, sounds, that sounds shady. So we start mixing in a little bit of truth with a little bit of stuff that's not true, and it becomes confusing. It becomes confusing for these guys. So, so this, this whole other group now in a whole other place is saying the same thing. You guys got to be circumcised. You got to keep the law of Moses. If you don't, well to show with you. <laughs> mm -hmm. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God knows the heart bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, yeah, clap, right? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Right? Now, Peter stands up and he says this with much authority. Now, is it because he's a big guy with a beard? It could have been. However, what is the authority of which Peter speaks this on? Now, if we go back to Ch Acts chapter 2, Peter's standing up preaching on the day of Pentecost. Power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is dropping on some folks. Both Jews and Gentiles are filled with the Spirit. They speak in tongues. People prophesy, right? It's, I mean, it's madness. It, this, it, it's breaking out. Peter was the one standing up preaching the message when it happened. So Peter, basically what he's saying here is, least I remind you, brothers, I was there. I was the one preaching it. God sent the Holy Spirit. You all received it. Okay, let's not forget that. So he brings that point to the table. And he says, keep in mind, there's no distinction between us and them. Their hearts have been, been cleansed by faith. So this is not about circumcision, not about keeping the law. This is about the faith that we have. Therein lies our salvation, faith. And as we went all through the book of Ephesians, if you don't quite understand that, then I did something terribly wrong. But... Faith. We get down to it where it's faith. Verse 10. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? And the disciples that he's talking about here are the Gentiles. He's saying, are you serious right now? The whole, beside the whole Holy Spirit thing, He's like, let's just put, move that to the side for a second. Beside the whole Holy Spirit thing, we're talking about a law that I can't keep and you can't keep and our fathers, our ancestors can't keep 
And here you are trying to put that on them. Really, dude? Really. All right? So, man, that's why I love Peter. I, lo- I, I love this guy. So he's, he's keeping it real. He's keeping it, like, really real right here. So he's saying that, that, our fa- that, that uh, neither us nor our father has been able to bear. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will, because there's no distinction in all that. And all the assembly fell silent. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they, relate, as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied. Now, this is James. James is the young guy, right? So he's like, well, at the, t- you know, at the time when a lot of this stuff uh, had gone down with Jesus, you know, James, he's probably 16, 17 19 maybe, something, something like that. He's a young guy, so he got a little bit of age on him, but this is like the most junior dude of, of all these guys there. So James speaks up. He says, brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles. So he's talking about when God first came to the Gentiles. To take, to take from them a people for his name. And with this... The words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, and the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from old. Now, if you look at that in your Bible, there are quotation marks. Let's go back to the book of Amos in chapter 9. Verse 11, And in that day I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches and raise, and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom. Remember, the Edomites are not Israelites. They're not Jews. They're Edomites, right? They are the fruit of the loin of Esau. They are Gentiles. And the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. So James, the youngest guy, is like, listen, let's build the case here. Peter stood up and preached the message. The Holy Spirit fell. The Holy Spirit came on the Jews. The Holy Spirit came on the Gentiles. The old covenant was done away with. Right? Peter's bringing bringing the point to the table. It's not about the law. It's not about keeping the law. It's not about circumcision. It's not about acts. It's not about the things we do. It's about faith. It's about what we believe and who we believe Jesus to be. Do we believe God or do we not believe God in every circumstance and every situation? And then James, I like this, right? The youngest guy, and he's like, okay, besides all the new school stuff, I'm going to take it back old school. When all else fails, read the scripture. He goes, yeah, remember? The youngest one of you talking about the oldest stuff. 800 years ago, this was spoke about? Come on, guys. You don't, you, he, he's basically saying, you don't have to believe me. You don't got to believe me. Whether you believe God or you don't. Whether you believe the Scripture or you don't. Now, if we go on, and we look at this, and we continue on in chapter 15, we'll see that at that point, it was decided Okay, yeah, the circumcision following the law for salvation is nuts. <laughs> okay, this bird is not going to fly. That ain't going to work. So you know what they did? Was they wrote a letter. The council, this is the first Jerusalem council, they wrote a letter back to that church in this, in this and, they say, and, and they address this. They're like, no, 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 no. This, that, that, that's madness. Y'all don't listen to that. Focus what you've been doing. Keep the faith. Stay away from these things. Idolatry. Stay away from sexual sin. Stay right. So they they write a letter. 
They write a letter going back to address this thing. So that, eventually that letter comes back to the church, and now they've got doctrine to follow. They're like, oh, look at that. We got elders, we got spirit filled people, right? We've got clergy, we got regular dudes all weighing in on this. We've got the council of other people in this, and then we got scripture to back it up. That's good, sound, solid doctrine. Besides all of that, they also have the experience to see. Wait a second. Holy Spirit rests on the Gentile and the Jew and the white dude and the black guy and the bald people and the people with a big nose and everything. Man. And faith is what makes the difference. Faith. So we cannot discount. We cannot discount the minor prophets and their message. It does show God's sovereignty. All of these show uh, God's wrath. All of these show the justice and the plumb line that is the Lord. But all of these also show His redeeming love for us. And how... Now listen. Okay. This was 2,000 years ago, what was written in Acts. Now, 2,000 years ago, if what was good enough for them 800 years before that is good enough for us today. How this impacts us, right? There's no part of this, of any of this, that doesn't apply to us and doesn't apply to our lives, man. Faith. Whether we believe it or we don't. Whether we believe God or we don't. Amen? Amen. All right. So that wraps up the book of Amos. I highly suggest that uh, everybody go through and read it front to back and point out and discover and bring to the surface all the stuff that I didn't. <laughs> all right? And you'll see. We'll see, man. God, this, man, God's Word is alive. It's amazing. It's amazing.